What I want to do, I guess, is follow on from where David sort of left off with the uh, vision of where we're going with our climate to see what the implications might be in terms of how that might transfer into, into fire. What we need to appreciate, I guess, there's been a lot of discussion about um, fuel management and, and fire and so on. There are four major factors that go into uh, how a fire behaves, the size of the fire, the intensity of the fire, how quickly it moves. There's the weather, which David's just uh, spoken about very well. There's the topography, which we don't have much influence over, except where perhaps the fires start. We've got the fuel that's out there, and there's quite a debate about uh, fuel management, which uh, I'm not going to go into at the moment. And there's the nature of the fire itself, how big that fire is, how it spots, how it spreads across the landscape. And we actually need to be clear about how all of these factors are interacting to give us the final result. Just a simple example is this, where we have a, uh, a point ignition of a fire compared with a line ignition. The area that's uh, burnt by a head fire from a point ignition represents about a third of the total area burnt compared with where we have a line of fire where five-sixths of the area burnt is by that line. It's just an example, I guess, of how um, the, the nature of the fire affects the final result that we have. This is a, a photograph from a, a study that was done by CSRO and uh, partners up in, in uh, Northern Territory a number of years ago. And what you can see in this image here is a, uh, down the bottom left-hand corner here is a fire that was lit by a point ignition and over here a line that was 100 metres long. Lit exactly the same time and you can see already the difference in intensity between those two fires just because the scale of the fire is different. It sees the landscape, it sees the the, the weather systems quite differently because they're operating at a different scale. And again here we've got a, a fire up the top here which has been lit from a point ignition, one from a 50 metre line ignition, one here from a 100 metre line ignition. All this under exactly the same conditions, same fuel. Uh, the only thing that's different is the scale at which the fire is operating. So how do we actually incorporate that into our fire behaviour models? Well, we don't really. That's a bit of a problem for us because it's a fundamental factor <laughs> to the nature of fire. So here again we've quantified it, this is in a, a bit of grass fuel where we can see as the width of the, the fire, head fire gets wider and wider, um, over here on the right hand side we can see there are steps in the way in which the fire develops. How can we use some of that information? So that's been related to the fact that the head fire width um, for a particular set of conditions, in this case just simply wind speed, so 7 km an hour wind, the fire needs to be about 40 km, uh, sorry, about 30 metres wide to reach its, its peak rate of spread. 14 kilometres an hour it might need to be 100 metres wide, 20 kilometres an hour it needs to be 150 kilometres wide. Well, we had 50 and 60 k average winds on uh, 7th of February, so the fire actually takes longer to get to its peak rate of spread. Part of that is determined by how heat is uh, transferred, and a lot of our experimental work in the past has been based on the fact that radiation spreads fire, doesn't it? And we get nice straight line uh, spreads of fire from that radiation effect. And here's a fire over in uh, South Australia. You can see nice straight lines of fire. Well, bushfires don't behave uh, in that way. They're not being driven just purely by uh, radiation. So some of our fundamental experimental work that we've done has ignored one of the most important aspects of heat transfer, which is convection. So this grey area here is representing, if you like, the fire spread uh, that's largely driven by radiation, but um, there are some numbers here which represent that somewhere between 20 and 40 per cent of the, the total or of the maximum intensity of the fire is experienced by those. So there's another 80 to, 60 to 80 per cent of the intensity is a result of the convective driven fire. And in this little low intensity fire here, a prescribed burn in the wombat forest, you can see the head of the fire, how much more intense it is than the flanks of the fire here. So let's scale that up a little bit. In 2003, we burned a million hectares in Victoria in one of the biggest experiments we've ever undertaken. And um, what we see here is the uh, size of the fire after day 10, uh, showing the red areas. And then we look at the fire after a second run of the fire on the uh, 18th, 17th and 18th of January, the same day the fire ran into Canberra. And then we had another run of fire on the 25th and 26th of January, uh, and it did another run. Just look at those a little closer. The first run of fire, the first bad day we had on this fire, basically the fire ran somewhere between 18 and 15 kilometres in a four and a half hour period. So those red arrows show the extent of the run that day. The second run of fire, 
ran 20 to 30 kilometres on about an 11-hour run. So a considerably greater distance, about twice the distance. And then on the third day, we had about a nine and a half hour period, and the fire ran between 40 and 50 kilometres an hour. So we've gone from about 8 to 15 kilometres to 20 to 30 kilometres to, to 40 to 50 kilometres. So was the weather getting progressively worse? Um, we need to know that. But what's important here, as you might notice the little red line around the outside here, the final footprint of the area that was burnt in 2003 was determined by just 25 hours of fire spread over a 59-day period. So what David's been talking about is it's really important to actually find out those extreme weather events because that's really what determines the footprint of the fire. 7th of February was all determined within a few hours, the extent of that fire. If we look at the weather conditions, and this is from a uh, just representative site in Gippsland, the day the fire started, the fire danger index was about 35. The first major run of fire was up 60, so it was in the extreme range. Second day, it was again about 60. Third day, it was about 55. So three days of extreme, but they weren't progressively getting worse, and yet the fire spread was getting progressively more. So what we were missing there is the fact the fire was scaling up, scaling up in the context of the, the atmosphere, the environment that it was in. So we, in our behaviour modelling, we don't incorporate, if you like, the massive amount of energy and uh, heat that goes into the convection column. We really look at fire as a two-dimensional process moving across the landscape. If we listen to some of the accounts of people who were involved in the 7th of February fire, we hear it was very much a three-dimensional process. It wasn't just simply a wave of fire moving across the landscape. And yet we're not modelling that, we're not actually incorporating that in any meaningful way to uh, when we communicate it to the public. What we can see here in this image is uh, at the top the white fluffy clouds uh, is a pyrocumulus cloud, is the technical term for it, but that's moisture that's condensing. As it's condensing, it's releasing more heat. It's effectively doubling the amount of heat that's coming out of the fire as far as the convection column is concerned. Massive amount of energy released as a result of these fires. David's already shown you this, this image, but again, you can see fires are acting at a meteorological level. The convection coming off these fires is a really important aspect of the fire here. Some of the white fluffy areas you can see on this image are those pyrocumulus clouds that I was mentioning before. So the Kilmore fire that ran into King Lake, the Murrindindi fire that ran into um, Marysville, and the Bunyip fire down here in the Churchill fires. One other thing that's important here is when you get an area of instability, in this case a low pressure trough moving over the fire, really increases the, the scale of the, of the fire. And it's one of the things that was a hallmark of the conditions of the fire running into Canberra in 2003. It's been a hallmark of many of our blow up fire conditions. So it's not just about the weather, but it's the interaction between the fire and the atmospheric conditions that's important to us here. And one of the things that comes out of the, the fire is the importance of, of, of this interaction is the spotting process, how fires propagate uh, ahead of itself. And you can see in this infrared image a number of spot fires starting ahead of the fire. That actually helps increase the rate at which the fire spreads. Here we can see a, a, a change, slight change in wind direction and that's affecting the direction the spot fires are being carried because they're carried at a higher elevation than the surface winds. So we've done some modelling within the university here to look at how important some of these effects are. We've looked at different mechanisms of, of how the, the uh, embers might, uh, or the spot fires might add to the fire behaviour. And it's all been basically a desktop type model. It's very hard to actually uh, get in front, find someone willing enough to stand in front of a fire to actually measure these spot fires. We've got some nice in fire uh, video footage which um, uh, helps show some of this process. But there are a number of processes, prefrontal burnout, um, Convective indrafts is really the biggest um, contributor to how spot fires help enhance the fire. They help draw the fire forward, but it's a three-dimensional process we're talking about. We've been developing, as part of the Bushfire Cooperative Research Centre, we've been developing a, um, a fire behaviour model, which uh, this is some of the output from it. You can start to see how complex the front of this fire is from the modelling process. Now, put yourself in this picture somewhere in here where you've got an area that's unburnt but you have fires around, you have an area of fire, you're in an area of fire and that can happen quite quickly as those embers land and spot fires start around you. 
It's not something we communicate terribly well to the community, I don't think, as a scientific community, how important it is to, to um, identify that the complex nature of these fire fronts. It's not simply a, a wave or a line of fire moving across the landscape, as we saw in those radiated heat uh, transferred um, uh, fire spreads. So one of the things that comes out of this is that we really need to look at fires from different scales, from when it's a little fire starting from a, perhaps a match on the ground uh, to where it's a, uh, a surface fire with a nice fire front, to where it's a crown fire, to where it's a complete um, blow-up fire like we saw on the 7th of February. The factors that go into the fire behaviour prediction need to change with the scale of the fire, but we don't tend not to do that adequately at the moment. So going back to we understand that there are important different elements of, of uh, fire behaviour that we need to take into account, but we're sort of missing the point and we've got some important um, research to do, I think, to, to really look at the three-dimensional nature of fire. And from some analysis of the 2003 fires, what I basically was able to conclude was that once you get into the extreme fire danger uh, rating, basically the weather is dominating the fire behaviour, not so much the fuel. Fuel is really important in the, the low, moderate, high and very high end of the, the spectrum, but the fire has so much energy from the weather conditions when it gets into the extreme uh, end that fuel plays a lesser role. As long as there's enough fuel to carry the fire, that's all we need. Then we can look at the interaction of the fire uh, on itself and we can look at the topographic thing. But the main two issues here are about the, the effect of fuel and the effect of weather. And we need to, to deal with that in a bit more detail. So we've been building this risk management model and a component of that is the fire behaviour model. And I just want to show you, before I finish up, this a little video of, um, of a, this simulation of the Otways fire from Ash Wednesday. Just to show you, I guess, how some of the complexities plays out. So what we've seen, as David described nicely before, a fire being driven by a northwesterly wind, the fire runs down to the coast, and then a southwesterly change comes along and blows the fire along the coast. The majority of the damage is usually done on that, on that change, and we've seen it time and time again, and 7th of February was no exception. What you can see um, ahead of this fire is, if you look closely, uh, all where the embers are, are landing, and also the complexity of the, what the front is like. There's an area of fire moving across the landscape here, not some nice uniform wave that's moving across. So if you're down here at Fairhaven or Areas Inlet, you can see you're getting hit by uh, embers well before the fire front gets to you. And then the fire comes in in quite a fragmented way, which makes it much more difficult for you to actually deal with. So that's something we need to actually communicate and um, make sure people, the public, are aware of what's, uh, what's going on here. In a bit more fine detail, you can see some of the slope and aspect is having a difference on the intensity, the colour from pale yellow to, to dark brown is showing a range of intensities. The purple areas are areas where the fire is self-extinguishing because it's running out of fuel, oh, sorry, these pink areas. Um, so there's quite a, a great deal of information that's involved in this, um, the output from this model. So it's providing a computational environment, I guess, to try and put into one place our understanding of how fire behaves. So we need to actually shift down that computational process. So some conclusions I would like to draw, I guess, is the dominant factors affecting fire behaviour change with the scale of the fire, but we're not adequately taking account of that at the moment. The fire size and atmospheric instability are important to blow up fire behaviour and enable feedback to the fire itself. Again, we know that's true, but we don't adequately take it into account. Drought, as, as David's already mentioned, is an important precursor to high-intensity fires. One of the reasons being the wet forests, our, our ash forests, our rainforests and moist gullies become available fuel. Not only do they become available fuel, but they're the area of highest fuel. So we see that extreme fire behaviour as, as a result of the fire moving unimpeded across the landscape by areas that would normally be barriers. The fire footprint is determined by a few hours of extreme weather. So we really need to concentrate not on the averages, 
not on a shift by one or two degrees, but the frequency of these extreme events and the combination of the wind, the temperature and the, the relative humidity, as, as David's pointed out. And because fire behaviour is a dynamic process, we need to be using a dynamic modelling environment. So I think we need to actually review, as a result of the 7th of February, the process of fire spread so that we can actually uh, better describe um, the science, the, the, the physical factors behind fire behaviour. We need to actually go back and rethink how we actually model fire. So I'll leave it there and we'll have some questions later. Thank you.